I was quite a good night, very windy in the middle of the night for a few hours. And uh, I was just Unfortunately, this turned out to be the quiet before the storm. Bill decided that we would spend the day at the clay pan and stay another night. But uh, these wind stillness didn't last long. And around nine o'clock, the wind picked up and pretty much blew a gale the whole day. So at quarter to nine, the wind picked up. So the Melbourneian is setting up for the day with a fly screen. I'm wondering how that is gonna go with the wind. So let's investigate. Camp Victoria, did to see how your fly screen endeavors go. So I thought it's a good idea. We want to have pancakes without flies. Good luck. Oh, it's no flies here at the moment. No, of course, because it's windy, but well, the wind, wind stops. I don't think the wind stops. Oh, you don't? Do you know the weather forecast? No. Okay. I have to say it is a beautiful spot Bill and Barb found during their travels. In particular because it is quite rare to have these size gum trees in the middle of the Simpson. And I really appreciate Bill and Barb sharing it's these with us. Hand. Put the Red Ark solar blanket up. Not that I really need to, but I'm charging three, five cameras, two drones. So certainly will keep me going indefinitely. I'm still running two 100 amp hour DCS lithium batteries under the bonnet, which are charged straight from my M2K 150 amp alternator. And I'm running that setup now for over two years. And yeah, I definitely would never go back to non lithium batteries. I really never have to worry to charge my nearly dozen of cameras, including drones, and keep my Bushman fridge running, which I usually use as a freezer. I used a remote location to let the kids have a go at driving the car and they were very excited. It's the coldest hand to run down this land where the ocean lands. Yeah, we're here at one of the smaller clay pans and looking for habitation sites. And uh, Bill reckons he found one there, which, yeah, there are quite a few um, primitive tools, um, chipped rocks and what looks like very weathered grinding stones which already fell apart though and we found certainly quite a few pieces of handheld cutting stones which are serrated pretty much made into kind of a serrated edge so yeah According to a friend of mine who is a senior archaeologist and anthropologist and does archaeological investigations and heritage surveys. Indigenous people did not create serrated rock blades on purpose. It just happened over time with use and they are found everywhere in Australia. Different watermarks. One is here. My foot is here. Another one is here. Another one is here. It's a attempt of water. It was an attempt to see what was there. Yeah, I can tell you that the native wells were often four or five meters deep. That's right. I've just done a bit of cross-country driving and even though we've been careful, it's not the season, still picked up a fair amount of uh, spinifex uh, yeah. rubbish. So I do have some screening material, which, well, I'm using for my tent, but I'm going to cut it up and build protection from the front portion of my radiator here so it doesn't pick up so much rubbish. Yeah, I found uh, these beef bars on Facebook. I contacted them, they sent me a few and I tried one at home already and they're actually pretty good. It's all organic beef and that's a chili bar. And that's my brekkie lunch, not the only thing, but pretty good. 
you need to get over the idea that you pretty much eating a muesli bar which is beef so looks like this I really like the beef bars, especially the chili one, but let's see what the young fella thinks. Um, yeah, I haven't tried this before, so... Yeah. So, at first it looks like a beef jerky stick, big beef jerky stick, but also a muesli bar. Yum, it's literally like... A big stick of beef jerky. Just a bit softer, huh? A bit juicier. Yeah, it's really good. Basically, you're driving a two-wheel drive all the way here. Like any of struggling. <laughs> and Popsy here didn't bloody uh, tell you how to do it. Oh, well, <laughs> just, I'm just calling it the way I said. <laughs> Ella dared Kalen that he could not run to the can site and back in under 45 minutes and she offered a $20 reward if he manages it. He doesn't mind the challenge and after sitting in the car for so many days he was keen to give it a go. He did the run barefoot and completed it well below the target time and was happy to pocket 20 bucks. Mixed berries, it's my absolutely favorite radix, I have to say, brekkie at least. I fill it up with water, stir it and then eat it right away without letting it settle because I like the crunchiness. However, the challenge mm -hmm. was to eat it without a supplementary intake of flies. Yeah, that's Benefex circles here. Hurt a lot. Do they hurt a lot? Yes. You put your foot or hand on them. Yes, it really hurts and it stings for a little bit afterwards. And you see, it's nearly impenetrable. They go in all directions. Given we had a fair amount of time to explore, we really looked at the little things. People often say there's not much happening in the desert, but I would disagree. If you take your time and look around, there are a lot of things to discover. Look, it looks like they're eaten and brought on look they're bringing their oh out. what the heck whoa i didn't see that wow. that's cool so that like they're cleaning cool. up the area by yeah, bringing it seems stuff like out. it no, i don't think they clean it up they take it in and they must take some nutrition or something from it Ian, Summer and myself decided to go on a walk to one of the neighboring clay pans a few kilometers away yeah i'm just gonna do it more than once so Beautiful interdunal swell. That is for sure, I mean. So much. Look at that. That's yeah, it's quite amazing here at one of the clay pans in the middle of the Simpson and quite likely are the first white people ever sit foot on this piece of ground. Uh, Summer found a camel hair stuck in one of the trees and that branch was very smooth so it must be one of the branches where the camel scratch himself. Run down this land where the ocean lands. If you're traveling with kids, I would highly recommend to take a set of sturdy 5 watt UHF radios. Personally, I really like the GME stuff because I'm using it for quite some time. They have excellent service and high quality units. It is very easy to get lost in the remote desert, so the kids were not allowed to leave camp without one of the UHFs. But beside of getting lost, there is also a chance for an accident or a snake bite or the likes. I always have a spare 5 watt unit in the glove box which I use for spotting and just as a reserve. And if the kids are out and about I have that switched on and on me all times. Should have come with us, Kay and me and Ella are on a walk. The relentless wind fortunately died down towards the evening. Uh, we definitely had the coldest night. 
apparently minus 6.5 minus 7 degrees in the Simpson Desert. There it is. Coldest night that I had in the Simpson, I'd say. Might that be a good idea. How do I heat up my gas bottle so I can get it to cook? Yeah, I will. I'll get it warm up a bit. I mean, bloody hell. Oh, it's just filming the bloody explosion. Yeah, exactly, yeah, but not when I'm standing next to it. <laughs> I'll tell you another stupid thing I did once. That is frozen. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ella, we even got you up early, huh? Or the yeah, cold got cold you up early. Yeah, minus warm. 7 degrees in the desert. The, the Kathmandu minus 2 comfort sleeping bag. Kathmandu. Plus five, comfort sleeping bag, cotton inliner, then I had a fleece blanket just at the bottom to fill up the space, I have a lambskin, and as a mattress I have the Expat LW7 down mat. And yeah, I was warm. I think another degree or two colder, it would have started to get uncomfortable, but as it was, it was good. In regards to clothing, I did wear a set of merino long johns and a merino top. I'm a big believer in self-reliant kits, so they have to take care of their own camping setup, putting it up, packing it back down, and I really help them only if uh, there's absolutely no way for them to do it. They usually each have their own single swag. However, for this trip, we only took one large single, but with both beddings in there, it becomes quite tight. So we just here on T90 in the clay pan, leaving that quite late, 11 o'clock. Um, and we tried to make it to Geo Survey Hill today, which will be all cross country. Today, some of the other vehicles uh, can lead, Sebastian in the front, and uh, I tried to capture a bit from the rear here. We'll see how far we get. I, my prediction is we won't make it to Geo Survey Hill today. Bill and Bob had to struggle each day to get five teenagers early out of bed and get packed and uh, ready to go in time. We only started driving for a few minutes when everything came to an halt again because the boys forgot to put the cap back on the fuel diesel container in the back of their car so the diesel spilled out into yeah. their bags. Might as well just sleep with it. The first part of the cross-country leg was the easy part because we drove mainly in the swales. That is a bit rough and bumpy, but you don't really have to cross any dunes. On this part now, we have to start crossing dunes and that is a very different kettle of fish. My dad's camera and he's just not looking. Shh, it's our secret. Ian drove that reasonably stock Isuzu just brilliantly. The few times he got stopped, he backed off the accelerator, stopped any wheel spin, just reversed back and gave it another go with a little more momentum. Don't drive it. I think the five boys on their piece with very little driving experience did pretty well with what they were given. Stop! No, 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 come back. For this kind of travel, I would recommend having a car which is an A1 mechanical and electrical shape, which has an adequate suspension setup for the weight you plan to carry and a good quality set of LT, AT or MT tires. From what the boys told me at the time, they were still running around 26 PSI as advised by Bill. Straighten up. This is exactly the terrain I built the Land Cruiser for. The solid axle vehicle with a long travel suspension means that my wheels nearly always have contact with the ground. The 35 inch BFG KM3 mud terrain tires aired down to around 15 psi just work brilliantly in sand. Beside what some so-called experts say, from my experience, the different tire profiles make very little difference in regards to traction in sand. 
I air down slightly more and I'm running now 15 psi warm and have still another 5 psi to play with before I really carefully would have to watch what I do with ultra low tire pressures. While my cruiser is double locked I hardly ever need to use them in sand and they were not required anywhere on this trip. When doing cross country desert travel, in the swales you should stay in each other's tire tracks because that minimizes the chance of tire punctures. However, when you cross dunes, it is often advantageous to forge your own track as the first vehicle breaks the top layer of the sand and underneath it is not compacted and can often make it more difficult to follow in the same tire tracks. mind out here you are 100% reliant on yourself and on your group because there is no chance for any outside recovery and even medical support is a long way away with no chance of landing an aircraft especially if you're out of helicopter range. there are no tracks all the navigation is done via the GPS in car and that is one of the big benefits running a GPS navigation application because you always know exactly where you are and in which direction you are driving at the time. There were only a few times when I got stopped and had to reverse and this is one of them. I tried to stay in someone else's wheel tracks and that didn't work out here. A slightly different line then did the job. By this time the group has spread out quite a bit along the dunes because every car was for itself and needed to find a spot where he could get over. I sometimes really wonder why I do the filming because beside of the driving, spotting, um, I'm also the only one filming and that certainly adds quite a bit of extra work. Mind you I have now perfected drone starts without leaving the car. Please keep in mind, for everyone beside Bill and myself, this was the first desert trip, so there definitely was a learning experience going cross country. For Bill and Bob, it was the first trip in an automatic Discovery 3, so there also was a learning curve involved. Traversing dunes cross country, especially east-west, is a completely different kettle of fish in comparison to a normal dune crossing on the French or Madigan line. I was a little surprised that Bill traveled back Here north are, to find a suitable spot rescue. to get over the dune instead of finding a way in the direction we needed to travel. So here it was time for us to wait till they backtracked to our little group. A friend of mine had given me some of the marine emergency flares which were expired and I was keen to test them and see how they work. And this was a good opportunity to mark our position and show the guys where we were. Just to give you a bit of an idea, we covered a distance of 27.8 kilometers over the whole day and the average speed was 9.2 kilometers per hour. I think that gives a good idea how slow the going was for some of the guys. While we were in the car for 7 hours this day, my actual moving time was only 3 hours. The remaining 4 hours was waiting around. Beautiful campsite here after a hard day of driving a um, few cars needed many attempts to get over the dunes and after radix yesterday one pot wonder chicken veggies fresh carrots brown rice and a new berenberg which i didn't try before slow cook but i use it just cold afterwards because otherwise more cleaning up 
So guys, this is the end of this episode. It was another long, exhausting day and it will continue for another day in the next episode. If you enjoy my videos, get entertainment or value from it, please consider that I spend a lot of time and money creating these videos and I need your help to continue doing so. Yes, I do receive some advert revenue and also the occasional product to review. However, that does not even cover the cost for the fuel of one trip. So if you enjoy my videos, please like, share and subscribe. And if you can, please consider becoming one of my Patreon supporters. And with the equivalent of a cup of coffee or two per month, you can support me in creating these videos. As a Patreon supporter, you also have a few benefits like early access to my videos, you can ask me a direct question via the Patreon platform and you have a good chance of winning some of the products I test and give away to my Patreon supporters. Thank you very much and I hope to see you along the tracks. In the next episode, the struggle for some of the cars to get over the dunes continues while we make our way to GeoServer Hill. I also wake up with a deflated air mattress and with well below zero degrees at night, this becomes interesting. Furthermore, we start to get concerned about our fuel consumption and how much fuel we have left. So make sure you subscribe and stay tuned for the next episode.